don't scare me. Well, it seems people really enjoyed the last time I dedicated one of these videos to Crash Bandicoot, so... Might as well do it again. One of my favorite parts about being a Crash fan as a kid was the fact that the series went off yearly releases. Every year I could expect some sort of new Crash game, sometimes even two, and that always made little old me incredibly excited. This also made slightly less little old me concerned when we didn't get any new Crash games in 2009, sure enough leading to a nearly decade long hiatus, but details. The point I'm getting at is, looking back, now near the end of my game design program and with a much better understanding of a game's development process, I feel like the series going for yearly releases may have actually done more harm than good. Especially for a relatively smaller scale franchise like Crash, going for yearly releases doesn't give your developers a lot of time to make games as high quality as they could, and that shows in the case of many Crash games. And arguably the most infamous example of this within the franchise is none other than today's topic, Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex. Wrath of Cortex was the first mainline Crash game made following the departure of series creator Naughty Dog, with the British development team Traveler's Tales taking the helm. The game was originally conceptualized as a free-roaming platformer, presumably similar to that of Mario 64. With Mark Cerny, the producer and designer of Crash 2, 3, and the then-in-progress Crash Bash, leading the project. However, after Cerny bailed following a falling out between him and the series publisher Universal, Traveler's Tales were forced by Universal to not only restart development from scratch, but to also switch the project from a free roaming platformer to a more traditional crash game. Oh, and they were only given 12 months to do all this. Wrath of Cortex launched as a PlayStation 2 exclusive in late 2001, before receiving a port to the Xbox and Nintendo GameCube the following year, with Crash Bash developer Eurocom assisting with the GameCube port. All three versions received pretty mixed reviews at the time, and nowadays the game is often viewed as one of the weaker titles in the series. Now speaking personally, I played quite a bit of this game growing up, more specifically the GameCube version, and I remember really enjoying it, so I felt it could be fun to revisit it and see if it holds up at all or not. Turned out well when I did that for Crash Tag Team Racing, so maybe Wrath of Cortex can get the same streak of luck. Oh, and just for clarification, I'm going to be playing the GameCube version of the game for this review. Technically, it's the worst version of the game, despite being the only version of the game to not have the infamously long loading times, but it's the one I own, so... yeah. The game begins on another one of Dr. Cortex's fancy schmancy space stations, with Uka Uka currently chewing out Cortex and his minions for their recent failures. Imbeciles! Fools! Nincompoops! That's the line we're going with, huh? Unironically using nincompoop as an insult. So this whole opening basically amounts to the villains discussing how Crash needs to be taken out if they want to successfully conquer the world, and Cortex revealing that he has a new mutant in the works that should get the job done. Though for some reason, he's initially trying to keep this project a secret, and I'm not entirely sure why. Haven't you been tinkering with some kind of new secret weapon in your laboratory? I don't know what you're talking about, Entropy. Dr. Cortex! I think he's referring to this super secret weapon you've been laboring over day and night. Uka Uka pitched the idea of awakening a group of ancient masks known as the Elementals to provide Cortex's new creation with the power it needs to destroy Crash, which Cortex is all for. Get ready to face my wrath, Crash Bandicoot! Hey, he said the thing. The cutscene then jumps to our heroes living a peaceful life when an earthquake, a volcanic eruption, a storm, and a tidal wave all suddenly occur at the same time. And of course, being Aku Aku, he immediately jumps to the conclusion that this is Uka Uka's doing. It appears that my evil twin brother Uka Uka is up to his no good tricks again. You think Uka Uka is behind every kitten stuck up a tree? I just want to imagine what would happen if Aku Aku confronted him, but he actually wasn't up to anything. I think it'd be kind of hilarious. What kind of diabolical scheme do you and Dr. Cortex have planned this time? No schemes. Oh. However, Uka Uka actually is up to something, and he unveils the elementals to Aku Aku, though not a whole lot happens with this revelation. There are some interesting implications here about the elementals being too dangerous to control, but those don't really lead anywhere, and the elementals instead just kind of collectively sneeze on Aku Aku. From there, Aku Aku returns home to give some exposition to Crash and Coco, and... You know what? Okay, now's the best time to say this. This opening cutscene is boring! I get they're trying to set the game's conflict up and all, but everything drags way longer than it really needs to. And with nothing really going on aside from giving out exposition, it doesn't take long for the cutscene to get dull. It also doesn't help that despite the interesting concept, the elementals aren't all that interesting as villains. The only thing they really have going for them are their voice actors. Thomas Wilson, Arlie Ermey, Mark Hamill, Jess Harnell, the last of which ironically voices Crash himself now. That's an impressive lineup of voice actors. But as characters... Is there a draft in here? 
Yeah, they're pretty weak. The only real noteworthy new character in the game is Cortex's new mutant, Crunch Bandicoot. But even then, that's only really because he ends up joining Crash and Coco at the end and becoming the Knuckles the Echidna of the team in later games. In this game, he's kind of just, I'm tough, I'm strong, I wanna kill Crash, and serves as the only boss character in the whole game, which is kind of boring, admittedly. And it kind of makes the opening with all the Crash 3 villains that much more disappointing given you don't fight them. But that being said, Crash games aren't played for their narrative as far as I'm aware. So let's get talking about the gameplay. Just as Universal demanded, Wrath of Cortex plays very much like a traditional Crash game, taking a special inspiration from Crash 3. You start in a warp room with five sub areas, each containing five levels that you can play through in any order. You get each level's power crystal to unlock that sub area's boss fight, and you beat that boss fight to unlock the next sub area. You've also got clear gems you get from either breaking every crate in the level or completing some other objective, color gems that unlock new routes in certain levels, time trial challenges to earn relics based on how fast you go, and a secret sixth sub area with levels you unlock from gaining the relics. Structurally, it's almost exactly the same as Crash 3. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with that, especially since, as I said before, that's exactly what Universal wanted. So long as notable improvements are made upon the formula, following the footsteps of the previous games isn't really that bad of an idea. Unfortunately, there's only a few areas where Wrath of Cortex exceeds the originals, and in many cases, it actually does worse. But let's take this one step at a time. First and foremost, let's talk about Crash himself. For the most part, Crash controls well. Really well, in fact. His movement speed and jump height are perfect for what they need to be, and all his abilities from Warped have been brought back, most of which have been implemented well, with a few even being executed better than before. Namely, the body slam, because he doesn't waste time laying on the ground like an idiot anymore. That said, there are a few abilities that have some issues, specifically the spin attack and the slide jump. The spin attack's problem mostly comes down to the animation. It doesn't communicate the range of the spin very well, making it feel a lot riskier when attacking enemies than it really should. Compare that to the previous games, where it's much easier to tell where the point of contact is. This isn't as much of a problem once you have the longer lasting Death Tornado spin upgrade, but still. The slide jump's got a bit of a weirder issue. That being that, at least from when I played the game, there tended to be input delay. It wasn't the case with any other move in the game, it only ever happened with the slide jump, but because of that, I often found myself sliding right to my death instead of jumping out of it. And given how crucial of an ability the slide jump can be, yeah, that was a bit of a pain in the neck. Now much like in Crash 3, Crash gets a new ability after every boss fight. Some are upgrades to already existing moves, like a double jump, the previously mentioned death tornado spin, and a super powered body slam that you get on a gem root for some reason, while some are different abilities entirely, like the Crash Dash, also known as don't do time trials until you have this, the Wumpa Bazooka, which I found to be a lot more finicky to aim than in Crash 3, and the only brand new ability to Crash's arsenal, tiptoeing which is literally only ever used to tediously walk on specifically placed lines of nitro crates without setting them off. I am now never going to be able to sleep peacefully again knowing a designer of Traveler's Tales thought that was a good idea. Actually wait, there's one other ability Crash has that got completely ruined. Climbing monkey bars. For quick context, this is how it was like in the previous games. And now here it is in Wrath of Cortex. Why does he go so slow? But hey, all these moves Crash has have to be put to use somehow, so let's get talking about Wrath of Cortex's selection of levels. Much like previous games, Wrath of Cortex has a mixture of traditional platforming levels and... vehicle levels, for lack of a better term. And there's a lot to say about both kinds. For starters, speaking more generally, there's a nice variety of settings, with levels set in Arctic Tundras, Medieval Castles, Space Stations, the freaking Wild West, just to name a few examples. Previous Crash games tend to have the same problem of having levels that feel too samey, Crash 2 especially, but even when reusing locations, Wrath of Cortex's levels all feel distinct from one another. Definitely helped by each level getting its own unique music piece, but we'll go over that later. I also like that there's a bit of a theming going on throughout the game, even if it doesn't apply to every level. This is something the previous Crash games did as well, with Crash 1's levels starting in the all-natural jungles and gradually transitioning into the darker man-made temples, factories, and castle, Crash 2 having a lot of snow levels, and Crash 3's levels all being from different time periods, what with the time travel plotline and all. In Wrath of Cortex's case, many of its levels tie into the theme of natural disasters, what with the elementals being involved in all. Dealing with tornadoes, outrunning tsunamis and avalanches, scaling an erupting volcano, these make for some really interesting set pieces, and I kind of wish these ideas were used just a bit more often in the game. Also, I really like that the last level of each warp room is one of Cortex's bases. I think it really adds to the whole idea of you taking Cortex and his forces down. Now that's Said, while the levels had all these going for them, only a few of them are really able to nail it in the execution. Most of the platforming levels are pretty alright, with only a few really knocking it out of the park. And as for the vehicle levels... Ooh boy! 
The vehicle levels are easily one of the most infamous elements of Wrath of Cortex. There's an abundance of them, and a lot of them aren't very good. Now granted, there are a few good uses of vehicles in the game. To name some personal highlights, there's the minecart at the start of Compactor Reactor, there's the Jeep in the second half of Jungle Rumble, there's the unfortunately minimally used Copter Pack at the start of Fahrenheit Frenzy, and of course there's the Atmosphere levels, but we'll dedicate some time to those in a little bit. Those are all fun sections, but beyond those, the vehicle levels range from meh to awful. Let's go over a few quote-unquote highlights, shall we? That sinking feeling, a dogfight level where you pilot a weird firefly looking aerial machine and have to shoot lock on homing missiles at battleships below you. There is far too much going on in this level, giving you zero chance to figure out how exactly to use the oddly obtuse homing missiles before you start getting shot at and killed. Smokey and the Bandicoot, a racing level in the Jeep against Cortex's henchmen. Basically the motorcycle levels from Crash 3, except even worse. The Jeep bounces off basically every tiny bump on the road, making it way too easy to lose control. And you're unable to reverse, so if you're going for the gem and miss a crate, you gotta restart the whole level over. Droid Void, which starts off as a traditional platforming level, albeit with way too many monkey bars to slowly climb, but partway through, you're forced into a mech suit, which initially seems kinda cool, until you realize that its jumping is incredibly stiff, and its only means of attacking enemies is a Wumpa Gun, which, much like I said about the Wumpa Bazooka earlier, is way too finicky to aim with. The level Crate Balls of Fire also uses the mech, but at the very least, that level consists mostly of a chase sequence, so it's fine in that case. Crash Droids, a space dogfight level that would honestly be pretty alright overall if it weren't for one simple factor. Ooh, why did I die? Hey everyone, mid-editing Maverick here, going off script for a moment to note that in the script I wrote that the enemies going kamikaze was causing the insta-kill, but as I'm looking through the footage while I'm editing, I genuinely can't tell what's causing it. I cannot tell, it is not consistent whatsoever. It's not, not kamikaze, because they this one enemy hit me head on, and it didn't kill me instantly, so I have no idea what's going on. I genuinely don't. Okay, with that said, back to the script. Coral Canyon, and by extension, Seashell Shenanigans and the opening portion of H2O No. All three of these are underwater levels, already a great sign, and all three of them are filled to the brim with enemies, many of which move way faster than you. They're all pretty annoying, but I'm giving an extra special shout out to these freaking mines. They fall down as you get close to them, and more often than not, they're in a position high enough that you literally can't see them until they start falling. And all these factors are bad enough when you're in the Scooby gear, but every single one of them are multiplied when you're in the submarine. And I'm just gonna be blunt, I freaking hate this thing. Because the only thing more annoying than moving slowly through a level overcrowded with enemies is doing that with a massive hitbox. Seashell Shenanigans is pretty bad, but Coral Canyon goes above and beyond to by far be the worst level in the entire game, and a level I have a personal grudge against as I missed a single crate during my first run, and since you can't go back past the midway point, I had to redo the entire level again to get the gem. The point is, while the platforming levels are alright, the vehicle levels bring the game down a lot. And I haven't even gotten to Coco yet. Wrath of Cortex marks the very first time that Coco was playable in a traditional sense in a Crash game. Not locked to riding a tiger or driving a jet ski, you can play as her in proper platforming levels. And there's a reason she never got that opportunity again until the Insane Trilogy. Gameplay-wise, Coco is inferior to Crash in literally every way possible. She only has about a third of Crash's moveset, with the Sly Attack, and thus the Sly Jump, being replaced by a slow-moving Sweep Kick Attack that you're gonna use, like, once. She only gets two of the six upgrades, with only one of them being all that useful. And overall, she feels like you're playing through a Crash 3 level using Crash 1's physics. Her jumps feel so heavy, to the point that it often felt like I wasn't gonna successfully make the jump. And in many cases, I didn't. Special shout outs to the gem route in the level Tsunami, where you have to do precision platforming over water that will kill you instantly upon contact. The amount of lives I lost on this section alone is absolutely ridiculous. The only reason I don't find her levels worse than Coral Canyon is because most of them spend half their length being chase sequences on either her scooter or snowboard. And I'm not gonna lie, there's something hilarious about the image of Coco outrunning a tsunami on a scooter. Jeez, I got a lot more heated about the levels than I initially thought I would. I feel kind of bad for going on that tangent, honestly. Yeah, a lot of the level design infuriated me to no end, but at the same time, Traveler's Tales only had a year to develop the game. And as someone who has experience now making games, I feel for them. I don't imagine there was a lot of time to iterate or polish design decisions. And I wouldn't be surprised if team members were unhappy with what they made, but had to send it in the way it was anyway. Okay, you know what? 
we're actually gonna shift gears a bit. I was gonna go more into things I didn't like about the game, like the poor sound balancing, the weak boss lineup, and how very few of these levels were designed with time trial in mind, which makes getting the relics a lot harder than it needs to be, but I'm kind of feeling like crap for tearing into a team that was put into such difficult circumstances, especially given how much the community's torn into this game in the past. So instead, I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk about what the game does right. I doubt anyone from Traveler's Tales is gonna see this video, but I still wanna give them some form of reassurance. You know, show to them that some things about the game work. So let's start with one of my absolute favorite parts of this game, the soundtrack. Holy crap, this game's soundtrack is incredible. The game was composed by Andy Blythe and Martin Justra, I am hoping I'm pronouncing those names right, a duo who had worked on several of Traveler's Tales' games before, and they definitely brought their A game with Wrath of Cortex's soundtrack. Seriously, give some of these a listen. And as I said before, they made an original song for every single level, something that's never been done for a Crash game beforehand, which really helps give each level its own identity. The only exception to this is the level Medieval Madness, which, despite having an original song in the PS2 version, reuses the song for the gauntlet in the GameCube version. And admittedly, it is a bit distracting that the music doesn't properly loop, but I can deal with that. No joke though, Wrath of Cortex's soundtrack is my favorite in the entire series. It's that well done. Now, as for visuals. Yeah, a lot of the character models do look a bit on the rough side, but given the time Traveler's Tales had and the fact that this was their first game on brand new hardware, I can let that slide. Besides, they certainly make up for it with some really nice looking settings. Nothing mouthgapingly pretty, yes, but pretty much every area is vibrant and nice to look at. Even darker looking areas manage to avoid looking visually dull. But now, let's talk gameplay aspects I liked, because when Wrath of Cortex does something well, it does it really well. For instance, the chase sequences, a series staple, are consistently great. And unlike the past games, there's a larger variety of set pieces for these sections. For one, you're running from a dragon in a castle. Another, you're driving away from a herd of rhinos. Or, as previously stated, outrunning a tsunami on a scooter. That's still hilarious to think about. These sequences are way more creative than they've ever been before, and they were a lot of fun whenever they came out. Additionally, while many of the platforming levels are just alright, some take those extra steps to honestly be series highlights in my eyes. In particular, there's the Gauntlet, a genuinely challenging, but not cheaply designed, well, Gauntlet obstacles, Crash and Burn, the best use of the natural disaster theming by having you gradually climb up an active volcano, making for a really fun level all in all, and Cortex Vortex, the last level of the main game and a solid test of pretty much all your skills. Though with that said, it's now finally time to talk about the absolute best part of the game, the Atlas Sphere. The Atlas Sphere is easily the best vehicle of the entire game, being a giant sphere that you roll around in monkey ball style, and the levels it's used in are fittingly physics-based obstacle courses, and every single one of them is fantastic. The level Bamboozled introduces the atmosphere in a larger environment, allowing the player to grow accustomed to how it works, while also including these incredibly fun roller coaster like parts. And the following levels very gradually get more challenging without ever feeling like a spike in difficulty. And hey, some of the old Crash bosses make appearances in these levels too. I would have preferred them to see them as bosses again, but hey, it's something at least. As for which atmosphere level is my favorites? I'm gonna have to go with Eskimo Roll. I like the music, I like the setting, and I like some of the obstacles. I think it's just really well put together. And while the boss lineup overall is kind of weak, the final boss is actually really well done. Avoiding an onslaught of attacks from every single elemental, actually having to use the bazooka for the first time in the series, all coupled together with a boss track that's an intense treat to the ears. The game overall may have been incredibly rough, but at least it ends on a pretty high note. So yeah, Wrath of Cortex is... Certainly an interesting game at least. I remember liking this game a lot growing up, so I was hoping that stay the case. But unfortunately, I was left disappointed that it didn't hold up as much as I thought it would. That said, despite having a lot of poor design choices, when I get something right, it really gets it right. 
Honestly, if Traveler's Tales were just given more than a year to develop this game, they probably would have been able to make something truly special. But unfortunately, it is what it is. They were given another chance to make a Crash game a few years later with Crash Twin Sanity, which was overall pretty good, but like Wrath of Cortex, suffered from short development time, resulting in a lot of planned content being cut and a lot of bugs slipping through the cracks. Nowadays, Traveler's Tales has been working on basically nothing but LEGO games, but hey, those have been consistently good, so at least they've got something going for them. Though now that I think back to how this all played out, out, I can't help but wonder what Mark Cerny's planned Crash game could have been like. Twin Sanity kind of took steps in that direction, but I'm curious to what a full-fledged free-roaming platform for Crash would be like. Maybe that's something we'll see in the future? Who knows? But anyway, that's enough from me today. This has been Black Mage Maverick, and until the next video, have a nice day, everybody.